really excited for this conversation because I'm here with Diana Olnick from CNBC and Fifth Wall has been incredibly fortunate in the sense that Diana before Fifth Wall had this long-standing interest in the intersection between real estate and technology and the energy transition. And we've been fortunate to do a lot with her on Fifth Wall's funds and Fifth Wall's portfolio companies. So maybe just to start, Diana, where did the, your interest in Fifth Wall come from? And maybe even backing up further, what was the interest in the energy transition as it relates to real estate? Well, first of all, thanks for having me because I'm, if you can fangirl over a VC fund, that's what I do with Fifth Wall because you guys have just done amazing stuff. And the companies that we've covered that you back have just been fascinating um, from a journalistic perspective. Um, I've been a real estate correspondent. I launched the beat at CNBC 20 years ago, I'm sorry to say. And there was a point about 15 years ago when I started to see how climate was affecting real estate, whether it was re resilience or whether it was with innovation and so I decided to launch a series called Rising Risks, which cut risks from climate change. Um, it was a long form series, and we looked at all aspects, whether it was from the insurance, whether it was a devaluation of properties within commercial real estate. Um, we even looked at you know, ski resorts and how they were gonna have to change their modeling. Um, it was a tough sell, I will tell you, at CNBC. We're a business news channel. There is a conservative side to it, and I, I won't say that there were not a couple of climate deniers out there within who just didn't want to do it. So we continued to push. We would do one every couple of six weeks or so. And we got to be doing so many that we branched out and said, OK, it's not just the rising risk to real estate, but the rising risk to everything in the economy from climate change. And as we continued to push and push, and I just kept fighting the bosses and getting these pieces on, um, they said, OK, let's do one climate series two years ago for three days, see if we can get the shows to put it on. We did. And then they sent me to Glasgow to cover COP26. And I got this pitch from this fund called Fifth Wall that I'd never heard of, where they said, hey, there's this guy, Greg Smithies. He's going to be at COP26. He'd really like to talk to you about startup companies. I was like, well, you know, we were doing CEOs. We had a lineup of a dozen CEOs in Glasgow who we were you know, interviewing, doing live interviews, doing pieces for the show's day side, and CNBC loves their CEOs. So I said, oh no, and they said, well, VC, it's gonna be a big deal. And I said, all right, well, maybe we could get a hit. And we call a hit a live shot. And I found Greg there, and we ended up doing one of the most fascinating interviews of my career, and I'm not, I'm not kidding. What he told me about the startups and the private funding going into climate in real estate was just fascinating to me. And the one thing he said that stuck was, I know you're covering the governments, I know you're covering the big public traded companies, they will commit billions of dollars. Private capital will commit trillions and they will be the ones to change the landscape. And I came back home and I said, all right, um, I wanna be the climate correspondent. And the boss has said, okay, so I'm real estate and climate. I said, I wanna launch a series called Clean Start. And it will follow the VC money into climate because the money is what's gonna make the change. And, and I know that sounds crude and awful, but you know it as well as anybody else, it's the money. So I wanna to talk to the money guy because everybody else here has talked about all the aspects of you know, clean energy and ESG and, and retrofitting and all the great things that go into it. But real estate, as we know, has been devalued because of a high interest rate environment. So you're the guy who has to convince people to invest and you're the one putting money into real estate. How hard has that been to do in a rising rate environment? Um, harder, <laughs> a lot harder. That's the honest answer. Um, but it, it's been different than the experience we have had in bringing money into where we started, which was prop tech. And I think there's actually a lot to be learned in that contrast. So when we first started Fifth Wall, this term prop tech didn't really exist. So we kind of had to convince the real estate industry that tech was coming, the tech boogeyman was there, and you're gonna be the next blockbuster if you don't invest into tech. And there was something kind of reactive to it. I felt like we were creating the demand for our product, a fund to invest into prop tech. And then around the same time as Greg was, you know, first met you, we were ideating this concept of a climate fund. And the experience of pitching it to 
real estate owners and capital allocators been quite different because we're not creating the demand. The demand is already there. It's a, this combination of carrots and sticks. And I think you could see it as it's local regulation, it's local law 97, it's carbon fines and carbon taxes, and real estate owners don't wanna pay that. And so if an investment in climate tech gives you a slight edge, they wanna do it. It is in cost of capital, which today is even more important, right? So there's now verifiably lower costs of capital for lower carbon footprint real estate. Look at any REIT's annual report and look at, no pun intended, how much real estate goes towards explaining everything they are doing around decarbonizing. And then it's tenants, right? You have to lease space. If you're not in the business of leasing space, you're not in the real estate business. And the largest tenants care about this. So it has been harder, I would say, uh, because of the macroeconomic environment we find ourselves in. But th this is not really a, a cycle issue, meaning this is a generational problem. We have built real estate and we operate real estate too expensively from a CO2 perspective. And you can effectively think of that as we're living in carbon debt. All of the real estate we now occupy, the spaces where we make the economy and we make civilization, all of it has a gigantic carbon debt load. It has to amortize it. And so even though rates are high, even though the real estate market is challenged, even though growth companies are challenged and tech is challenged, that will not go away in five years or 10 years. And so what we're really focused on is how do we convince owners who might be struggling right now to take that long-term view, right? This is the last thing you want to cut if you want to be a durable real estate business that lasts decades. So when you were starting this fund, though, there was just talk at the time of government backing. I mean, you had a different administration before um, that didn't do anything with climate, and Biden came in, and it took a while, and it was dicey, and were we going to get anything passed? Now, suddenly, billions of dollars going toward what you want to see. Did that help or hurt the investor sentiment in that, okay, government's taking care of it, we could put our money somewhere else, or, oh, government's backing it, we should get in there, too? It was a little bit of both. I'm not sure I'm gonna have a satisfactory answer for that because we, we started a climate fund under the Trump administration, which is the most environmentally regressive administration probably in American history. I don't know about the 1800s, but it was pretty bad. First thing he did was pull out of the Paris Agreement. But what's really interesting about real estate is that in the United States, real estate is taxed and regulated locally, not federally. And so whether you're in a red state or a blue state, most real estate value is concentrated in cities. Most cities tend to be progressive and they have progressive constituencies. And so for that very reason, it's no surprise that carbon fines and carbon taxes started on the coasts in the blue states, but they're now in the red states. Well, I'm gonna go through this actually in the presentation to close this out, but carbon fines and carbon taxes are coming to every American city. And so I think that provided a real tailwind. Now we did not predict that uh, Biden, his first act as president would be to put the US right back in the Paris Agreement and that the IRA would happen. I mean, that's been like a step function change because anytime you mobilize $2 trillion of government money towards a problem, in this case, the energy transition, it's a pretty big economic opportunity. It dwarfs the internet and information technology. And so investors are starting to get that. The one thing I would say is that it has been a challenge to figure out how to position this, right? So I think we kind of synonymously use climate tech and energy transition depending on who we're talking to. So if we're talking to a red state investor, we say energy transition. If we're talking to a blue state investor, we say climate. But in reality, they're actually the same thing. And it just it's, it's whether you focus more on the carrots or the sticks. So given that local aspect of it, are you concerned at all if we should perhaps get a different administration? Uh, I mean, it's very likely that we'll have lots of ebb and flow federally, but I don't see a lot of change locally. I mean, most mayors in the United States are Democratic. And if you look at most voting districts, like take the most conservative state, the reddest state, the reddest of red states, take like Mississippi. And if you were to look at a voting map of Mississippi, you'd see like maybe one or two blue dots and a lot of red. The blue dots would be over Jackson and maybe Biloxi. I don't know that many cities in, in Mississippi. But if you then also looked at 
where is real estate value concentrated in the state of Mississippi? It would all be in those two blue dots. And we can't move buildings. So buildings are stuck where the most progressive constituencies are. And so I think they're, and they're very easy to tax for the very reason you can't move them. So I think you will see a lot of federal ebb and flow, but I think at the local level, that is what's most important. Um, so given everything we've seen in the past year, which has been one of the most horrific years in climate that I can ever remember, um, we talk a lot about decarbonizing, about clean tech, climate tech, prop tech, et cetera. Are we focusing enough on resilience? I mean, most of the real estate out there is old, right? We can build cleaner, we can build better, we can build net zero, and we can build to all of these great green standards, but there's a lot of old real estate out there that needs to be protected, retrofitted, historical real estate. Is enough, I mean, of the companies I see out here and that you bag and stuff, I don't see a lot going into resilience. It's a great point because I think resilience is a lot less sexy than new construction. That's the reality of it. And in most of the Western world, we already have the buildings that we're gonna have to decarbonize. Like 2050 is not enough time to rebuild everything with a roof in the Western world. Now, there are markets that are different. So if you look in certain parts of the Middle East and Africa and Asia, there is a greater emphasis on new construction. But I think we have a kind of twofold problem around resiliency, as you put it. One is a tech problem which is today, if you were to deploy all the best technology that exists into a commercial asset, let's say an office building, you would get about halfway towards operational carbon zero. It's an estimate, it varies by building and by geography and how you source your energy. We're about halfway towards it, meaning that gap, that 50% gap, that's a new technology gap. That's technologies that either don't exist today or are not commercially viable today. And that is the role of venture capital to provide. The second part of it is actually a little more boring, honestly, which is we need lots of jobs and lots of service jobs to actually retrofit these buildings. To fix that many homes and buildings is gonna take a mobilization of labor unprecedented. And I think you're gonna to start to see lots of private equity firms that take advantage of this because they see it as a very big opportunity. But there's not enough labor to build houses right now. I mean, we have a housing shortage because we have a labor shortage. That's, How are we gonna get them to retrofit? That's where the government comes in, right? I mean, this is the role I think we want government to have is to bend the cost curve around priorities for a nation or for a state or for a city that the private markets are just not solving for. And so I think you see parts of this in the IRA and you see kind of hints of it, but I think we're gonna have to see a lot more. So to be clear, like Fifth Wall having a half billion dollar fund and a handful of other VCs raising billions of dollars is a drop in the bucket of the cost to actually retrofit these buildings. So what we need is government support, training programs, incentives, all of that to actually kind of liberate the private capital that really wants to flow into the space but might not have the incentives to do so today. So do you think big corporations, I mean, are they being responsible enough if they don't have a climate plan, big real estate companies out there? Two years ago, I mean, I had to make this case. <laughs> like I had, to, I had to justify to lots of real estate owners that would say, well, what, wait, I'm a real estate company. Why would I invest in climate tech, right? Well, backing up for a second, there was two things that I would get. The first is, oh, we already invest in climate tech. And I'd be like, oh, what do you invest in? And they would say, we put solar panels on our roof. And I was like, that's not what invest means, right? Like when I buy a carton of milk, I'm not investing in the milk company. Buying a product is not the same thing as investing in the IP, in the technology, in the human capital to actually make it commercially viable. So the first thing was just changing that mindset of investing is not just buying products. And the reason that's so important is, as I mentioned, even the best products today only get you halfway there. So we're betting on new stuff. The second thing is, I'm a real estate company. Why should I do this, right? I'm in the business of keeping the lights on and keeping the rain out and operating security. I don't do tech investments. Now, I've struggled with that ever since starting Fifth Wall. What I would say is the collective mind change within the real estate industry around prop tech, that prop tech was seen as not just defensive, but offensive, and now I would say existential, that has happened way faster in climate tech. I do think today we are at a point where a large national footprint real estate owner 
It is irresponsible not to have a strategy around investing into climate tech. And the reason is that it is both offensive, good business, but it's defensive because all of your peers are starting to. And they're going to have cost of capital advantages, and they're going to be able to lease to tenants that you can't, and they're going to be able to see around corners you won't. And I think the real estate industry is slowly taking that on. And that's, that's exciting. Like, that has been an inflection since we started Fifth Wall. OK. Now you're going to ask me something, right? I am. Um, <laughs> and I guess my question is, you know, we've obviously done some stories together on Fifth Wall's funds and, you know, Fifth Wall portfolio companies. And I, I always wonder this, because there's this idiom, right, that people love bad news. <laughs> If and it what bleeds, I, it leads. Yeah, exactly. That's the, I guess that's the, the quote. But is climate seen as bad news or good news? And how does that impact like, how a story, like when you covered Roadrunner, is perceived by the public? Is it good or bad? Um, I think in covering climate, it's both. I mean, do we all love to watch the natural disasters? Do we all watch the hurricanes coming in and watch the flood video over and over again? Yes. Why? Because it's just, you know, it's like why we go to the movies, because it's just incredible and it's real. And so we see these natural disasters and that's part of climate. And it's bad news, but everybody wants to watch it, right? Those are the highest ratings you'll ever see is on the Weather Channel and CNN when there's a storm coming in or when something's burning. Um, that's what everybody wants to watch. When it comes to the climate stories, um, we launched the Clean Start series a year and a half ago, and we've profiled 52 companies, and they haven't killed our series yet. And I'll tell you at CNBC, when they don't like something, they kill it fast. So I would say that there is great interest in seeing the good side, seeing the progress, seeing what we can do. And from an investor perspective, because that's who our viewers are, where can I make money in climate? And that's not a bad thing. You know, people say, oh, well, that's that's unsavory. I don't want to make money off of climate change. You know, well, go ahead, please make money off of climate change because that's how we're going to fix our planet is by investing. And if there's a return in that investment, fantastic. I don't, you don't do it for free, right? It's, it's how we get investors involved. So I would say that there's good sides and bad sides, just like with any other story. The other question I have, it's, it's one I think I asked you before this to preview it, and I think it stumped both of us, but I'm curious to kind of like creep up on an explanation. When, when I first started the Climate Fund, I remember looking at the stats, and I was like, okay, there's you know, transportation-focused climate funds, and there's manufacturing-focused climate funds, and agriculture-focused climate funds, but none focused on real estate, and the stats are striking. Real estate's 13% of United States GDP, but 40, 40% of US CO2 emissions. So the biggest contributor had no focus on it. So not only were there no funds on it, I didn't even see conferences like this or content being made about it. Why did the real estate industry get a free pass for decades when other industries were increasingly under a spotlight? Why do you think that happened? And, and I said to him about 10 minutes ago when he asked me this question, I said, I don't know, but I thought about it a little bit uh, since then. I think they probably got a pass because you don't think of as a building as an emitter. You think of a car, you think of an airplane, you think of an industry, you know, industrial complex and smokestacks and stuff. It was surprising to me when I first learned how much of a carbon emitter the built environment is, not just the construction phase of it, but my house sitting there when I leave every day, I know my car sits there and it's off and I take Metro because I'm a good climate person, but my house is sitting there burning energy and it's empty all day long. And millions and millions of houses around the world, billions of houses are burning energy all day long, sitting empty. So I think when you look out at the general public, they didn't think, oh, my house is emitting the way I see my car emitting. And so perhaps also real estate being a very big behemoth, an old 
I, I mean, real estate hasn't changed. When we look at the innovation in home construction, which I do a lot of home uh, innovation stories, 3D printed homes, or just the way we changed the way we built. I mean, we didn't get nail guns till like 10 years ago. I mean, real estate is just a dinosaur when it comes to innovation. And some of the biggest developers out there, you know, the Lennars of the world and the, and, and the, the big REITs, they'll say it. They'll admit it openly. We just don't innovate. And only now are they beginning to. Only now are they being told they have to. Part of that is government, and part of that is the public. And you know, I've heard from several REIT um, CEOs that you know their tenants are demanding it. When they move into a building, they want to know if this is a clean building. And so when your customer demands it, your customer is king, right? So you better start doing something about it. But it took a long time because real estate just wasn't the focus. We talk about clean jet fuel. We talk about, obviously, clean gasoline, you know, electric cars, et cetera. But I was even saying, even the shipping industry is like real estate. For some reason, it wasn't until two months ago that they actually signed their first decarbonization agreement ever because, you know, people don't think about ships with their stuff. They think about their stuff, even though those ships are bringing their stuff to them. It's just not in the public sphere. The other question I wanted to ask you, because you sit at the intersection of all of this content and all of this news about the energy transition in real estate, is sometimes you go to these conferences and it can feel really depressing, especially climate conferences, because you kind of get this existential dread around the world and how far behind we are and all the negativity that just surrounds the climate crisis. But from your vantage point, when you look at the energy transition. The first question I have is, what gives you the most optimism? I hate to say it again, it's the money. I, I work for the Money Channel, but when, you know, I actually have a book called Taming Climate Anxiety that I got at another conference at the Aspen Institute Summit. Um, because you do get anxious. You do look at all of these headlines and you see how little is going into it and how long it's gonna take. And they say, oh, we have to do this by 2050. And then the IPCC comes back and says, oh no, we're already past one and a half degrees you know, global warming and, and we're all screwed and, and I'm gonna go to COP28, I hope, and it's going to be very dire and we're not gonna see the governments get together and do what they're supposed to do. So it can be very frustrating. But then I see the money going into it. And I say, if that much interest now and that much money, and honestly, it's really only in the last five years because, and I'll say this from a media perspective, um, when I launched that series five years ago, there was a lot of pushback on my using the words climate change on television. They did not want me to say it. If I interviewed Brendan for a story and he said climate change, that was okay. I could use that sound bite, but they didn't want me I could say increasingly extreme weather, but I, I couldn't myself use those words because there was a sense of discomfort. Two months ago, NBC Universal put out a massive mandate across all of the news organizations saying that if you are doing a story about the effects of climate change, you must at some point in this story say, due to man-made global warming. So in five years, we've come from there to there, that gives me optimism. And from my vantage point, which is where I cover the money and I see that money going into it and I see conferences like this that didn't exist and I talk to real estate developers and I see this incredible innovation and all of these companies that we cover over and over, that gives me optimism. But I, I'm gonna throw the same thing back at you because we see these headlines every day that we are not getting there fast enough, that we're not gonna make it happen, that these catastrophes are just getting worse and worse and worse. What keeps you in the business of saying, I still want to put my money there and I still want to get these tiny startup companies, make them viable because these little guys are going to, they're going to do it. They're going to make it work. They're going to save the planet. Well, now that you put it like that, um, <laughs> because I'm unhinged and a sociopath, <laughs> um, I'll start with why it is depressing, and then what gives me op uh, optimism, because it's the inverse of it. Right when we started, I was like, okay, let's take inventory of how much the real estate industry has put into investing in climate tech over the last decade. So we did our best, we crawled through every REIT's annual report and looked at the footnotes, and we tried to add up all the numbers. And we probably didn't catch all of it, but 
Here were the numbers we did catch when we added it up over a decade. $96 million. The pub, all the public companies in the real estate industry invested into climate tech over the decade before we started our climate fund. To put that in perspective, that's like an nothing. eighth of a building. You know what I mean? It's nothing. And to feel a little optimistic, our first climate fund was half a billion dollars. It's 5x that. Now, it's a drop in the bucket in terms of the 18 trillion we have to invest, but parabolic growth has to start somewhere. And I think what is inspiring is that we are seeing a mobilization of capital, yes, from the federal government, but from private investors. Exactly what Greg told you three years ago has borne out. It's real estate companies, public and private. It's the largest real estate allocators. So allocators to debt and equity and insurance in the real estate industry. They are investing at scale. And now it's the largest sovereigns that are doing the same, oftentimes from fossil fuel exporting countries that have derived a lot of their wealth, their national wealth from fossil fuels. So the fact that so much capital is flowing into the space gives me a lot of optimism. Now, with that said, it's really hard work. It's exhausting. Um, and I think anyone who works in climate feels that exhaustion. But the fact that two years ago, a conference like this didn't exist, and now it does, I think is the start of something really cool. And I probably asked these in the reverse order, because it's better to end with the optimism versus the pessimism, but I didn't. So from your perspective, what makes you the most pessimistic based on what you see? Uh, the storms, the fires, the heat, the you know, I'm, I'm old, I'm older than you, and I remember when it wasn't like this. Um, and just in the last several, you know, last five years, the amount of destruction, the amount of loss of life, the, the disasters, that's, I mean, I work in the business of telling great climate stories and seeing optimism and potential and investment and opportunity, and then I just get really nervous about what I'm seeing on TV on all the other channels which is the disaster. And so that makes me most pessimistic is that we're not gonna get there fast enough. And so I wanna do everything that will get us there fast enough, even if it's the tiny companies, even if it's you know pushing things onto the news that I know the producers don't want. I mean, next week is climate week and the only in New York City, and the only way that I'm gonna get this on TV is if I can get top level CEOs interviews. They don't wanna do stories on anything that's not money involved. They don't, it's just, it's a hard sell. You know, and as a reporter, I didn't realize, with real estate, I can get anything. I can do mortgage rates out the wazoo. I can talk about uh, housing forever. They'll take it all. But it's a push. It's a sell. It's a hard sell to get climate on TV. Maybe not on the mainstream media, but in business. Um, but I feel like, you know, that is my new mission. And that's what I want to do. And so that's... That's how I balance out the pessimism, I think. Um, I'm just interested in one more question for you about globalization. I do follow him on Instagram, so I know you're basically in a different country every day. Um, I know that you're talking to different investors. How does, what's the difference when you're talking to Western investors versus everywhere else in trying to get them to put their money into climate? It's a great question. I'm gonna break it into two groups. One are you know, the investors whose primary business is real estate and then those whose primary business is investing, because it's kind of a different answer for both. So for real estate, Europe has been at the vanguard for quite some time. Europe has led the charge. Um, Europe understands this. Europe is trying to price this into real estate, and I would say they feel three to four years ahead of the US, and correspondingly, I would say Asia feels five to 10 years behind the US. So there's a spread, there's a lot of daylight there. Um, and commensurately, we try to spend time with the investors that get it, but there's a lot of real estate value in the US and in Asia. So I'm optimistic that Europe represents the high watermark or what we're solving for in the US and in Asia. From an institutional investor perspective, I've actually been surprised because we've seen more interest from international investors. 
Fifth Wall's funds are increasingly backed by large international allocators, oftentimes from the Middle East and countries that generate a lot of wealth from fossil fuels. And I think they understand because they sit at the nexus of energy capital markets and they understand this is a diminishing asset for them. So and it's not weird to you that COP28 is in Dubai? It's not weird at all. I actually think it's really awesome. Because there's been pushback on that. You know, well, the worst thing we'd want in the world is some factionalization between you know, those that have oil and those that don't. I mean, that's not going to work. Like the, the problem with climate change and nationalism and borders is that functionally, this is a collective action problem we can't solve at a national level. Like CO2 is indifferent as to where it was burned. It goes everywhere. And so there are going to be wars fought over this. I think earlier today someone made a point about water being you know, the, the, the kind of battleground for, for wars, which it has and will be, but CO2 absolutely will be. Like these issues around countries complying and not complying, this is 100%. This is an instrument of geopolitics, and it will absolutely become the case because it is the definition of a collective action problem. But I got a little, I would say, off track. I would say that... The exciting thing for me is that a lot of international money is flowing into the opportunities. Now, what we are seeing is the same thing you see in software, which is that the best technology companies, by and large, are here in the US and to a lesser extent, or North America, and to a lesser extent in Europe. And my hope is that the ecosystem of climate tech companies becomes global, because we actually are rooting for that as well. Is this where you get to push me off stage and finish up, or? No, we got, okay. we got two, we minutes. two minutes. We got two minutes, okay. <laughs> um, all right, so what else have we covered? Um, so I guess going forward, you, you have a fund, obviously. Um, is there enough in your mind, are you already seeing demand that you're getting the next climate fund? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think that, you know, the first climate fund was, was like the first climate fund of its kind, focused on the real estate industry. I, as far as I know, it's still the only fund, right, in that space. Um, yeah, I think when we raised it, a lot of owners who hadn't invested were like, oh, that's really cool. Like, that's interesting. And so we've had a lot of the groups that were reticent early on, they've started to approach Fifth Wall because they see the value in it. And now, as I mentioned, a lot of allocators, like the largest, most sophisticated owners of real estate, understand that they have this liability. Meaning, if you're allocating to REIT equities or real estate debt. You are short CapEx. So we quote these numbers of like, it's gonna cost 18 trillion to decarbonize the US real estate industry and 13 trillion of that is commercial. You are short that, that capital if you are long the equity. That's just how microeconomics works. So what increasingly these owners understand is that they need some kind of a natural hedge. Meaning if you've been buying or selling or financing or making money off the real estate industry for any time in the last two decades, you had it easy. Those were the easy days. They're in our rear view mirror. The future is one in which a lot of cash flow goes into CapEx. It goes into retrofitting. It goes into the unsexy retrofitting. It requires enormous amounts of service jobs. And right now, the allocators to real estate are like, we don't have a plan. And... When those allocators start to divert some capital to climate tech, that's when the numbers get really big. So that's one side of your business, but then you've got to pick the companies. And I'm sure there are folks out here who would like to know, sexy or unsexy, how do you pick the companies you back? Oh, it's a, you got 26 seconds to answer that. Okay, go. Most important Fast. question. <laughs> um, we look for companies whose growth we can accelerate. So we have this unique model. We have large institutional strategic LPs that we want to be the biggest adopters of the tech that we're investing in. We use them as a way to diligence these companies and understand if their value proposition is there. And then we try to accelerate their growth with them. So it's a very simple model. So to any entrepreneur in the room, when you know, you're seeking capital from Fifth Wall, one, we have a lot of our partners here, so grab one of them, tell them about your business. But what we most want to hear about is how can we, Fifth Wall, help your business rapidly scale by virtue of connecting you to the largest owners of real estate across many different asset classes and many different geographies and many different sizes and scales and types and flavors. But like, we can connect you. So 
make it easy for us. Like that's what we want to do. So um, I guess with that, well, we're you're done. the boss. It says please end now. Yeah, <laughs> politely telling us to end. But I want to thank everyone and thank you, Diana, for an amazing um, panel. Thank you.